January, December 10th, 2014, presenting an abridged uh, presentation on my paper on integrating contemporary media in the classroom, video games, and pedagogy. Anecdotally, English adoption of technology is often limited to word processing. Video games in the classroom is out as cutting edge as technology gets. Few utilize whiteboard projectors or other tools, and many feel that non-print media is an attack on English proper. Rideout for and Roberts 2010 reported that 60% of people aged 8 to 18 playing almost two hours per day. Becker in 2007 suggested that motivations for playing video games are the same kinds of instructors need to create effective learning. Still, video games have been reduced to behavioral rewards rather than a teaching tool, according to Kimmer and McFarland 2008. I wondered if the proper use of, the, of this tool in the classroom because if students are already using these things and if they could be used to learn, could we not make lifelong learners through video games? Uh, I remember senior year of high school, my favorite teacher had a new class, supposed to be cutting edge. Mind you, this was 2004, not exactly the early years of television and movies. In this class, we looked at movies like we would books, examining themes and choices the characters made, looking at the symbolism and the like. It was exciting, and for a few years after school, it served me better than knowing how to do the same for books. This was a medium of social messages, and I was using. Knowing how to parse the good and bad in film felt like the same kind of exercise as books were in school. The class didn't survive, and the next year it was deemed too radical. Yet, Bill Nye was in our classrooms. If film is something that is acceptable and well used, how about video games? And in my own classroom, I wonder, should and how should video games be used in secondary English classrooms? So if Becker is correct, I suppose the first place to look at video games was how they affect motivation. Yee's article was a huge survey on 3,000 plus players. Uh, I actually believe I was one of them. What he found disproved previous theories. It was once believed that players had one reason for playing a game, and it dominated and removed other motivations. The study found the opposite, and that most players' motivations could be accounted for in three components of immersion, socialization, and in their achievements. He had some notes about females having equal scores on motivation, but males were higher in achievement and females in social, though both socialized equally. But Ammo and Commerce elaborated using a smaller sample, but more in-depth study and found that females like video games as much as males, but with different reasoning, confirming ye. What was interesting uh, was their notes on females having lower self-efficacy in their games. That is, when males played, they were more certain they could beat levels, troubleshoot problems, and thus attained self-sufficiency in games much faster. However, both males and females wanted challenges in their games, which is a crucial component of instruction. While games change the stakes, it doesn't mean that the gamer has softful motivations for gaming, but instead has been pro uh, properly motivated to achieve mastery. Yet the question of whether these challenges and motivations yield learning is still there. Schrader and McCreary did a huge survey and noticed that gamers did feel as if they had gained knowledge and expertise, at least on the system, uh, the game they were using. Maybe self-evident was that the younger the person, the more likely they were to claim expertise. The survey also found gamers collaborated effectively and were much more likely to value the person they were gaining experience from than a resource, which is probably something that could be looked into during future research as a means of collaborative learning. Anyway, just because they were learning about the game doesn't mean that they were learning anything that is useful academically and towards their lives. Kiroga et al. used a series of tests to see if gamers actually were activating general intelligence, and they found that in every case they were. However, even while they were getting better at the games themselves, they weren't necessarily gaining any intel general intelligence. Uh, subject matter gains were actually not there. But they questioned if a longitudinal study might not fix that. That means most of the math games are really in question, and using a video game as a teacher is problematic. Not to mention that none of this really addresses video games in an English classroom, and so far all the research really on games, uh, not explicitly secondary level. So I found Dodd and Schultz, Colby, and Colby, and I do believe that is the surname, unhyphenated, who taught English classrooms. Uh, Dodd actually seems to ignore most video games and uses instead what he calls not games, which are these, like, novels turned into interactive stories. Students click through while characters say their lines and the like, and sometimes there are choices like what to hear about next, or... Uh, he essentially treated video games like books, and found that for some students it worked really well but for others it was distracting, and he ends up calling them another tool in the teacher arsenal. 
Schultz, Colby, and Colby treat video games uh, like Mr. Bray did movies in my high school media liter literacy classroom. That is, they play and then write about the game. They would do reviews, write walkthroughs, study theme, and the like. They report a lot of positive results and mention that they saw increased collaboration with, like we would expect from the motivational work of the earlier articles. And as a bonus, they saw their social conduct got better. Dodd talks about how instructors that aren't comfortable with the games have a hard time implementing, citing that there's a real disconnect in this sort of generational gap that other authors might disagree with. Such as Yi, who used a very large sample size and mentions the average gamer is in their mid-30s. He actually had a lot of articles and something near 30,000 in his studies on video games. But speaking strictly of this work, there is some serious issues. Namely, the article is missing a lot of methodology and especially lacks any kind of internal or external validity checks. Yet he is cited in Bonanno and Commerce and Hoffman and Adelson and several thousand other papers. Uh, if his work is wrong, it could be detrimental to the entire field of study. And I believe the article is a post hoc of a different research project. The other sources in the theme did a much better job with analysis, as you can see, with the uh, SPSS, Pearson Chi-Square, Alpha Checks, and the like. The biggest issue, as I mentioned, is none of these experiments were looking directly at students or the education field, and so we have to assume that the external validity is there in the educational context. And to whatever extent, we know that that is, as Schrader, McCreary, and Kuroga used a lot of analysis themselves. ANOVA, Bartlett, Kaiser, May, Kaiser Meyer, Olkin, Postdoc, Principal Axis Factoring, etc. Kuroga used a smaller sample size, but they also subjected the participants to a huge variety of tests that were all well documented in psychology as internally and externally valid, such as the Corsi battery. The trouble then was how little of their research proved anything. It wasn't that they didn't prove anything helpful for educators, they did to some extent, but when they didn't find statistically significant results, it wasn't because learning wasn't occurring, it was because they were unsure based on internal validity factors like time and the instruments themselves. Yeah, it's still a far cry better than the results of Dodd and Shelby, Colts, and Colby, in my opinion. Their analysis is textual, using narrative methods and qualitative experiments that really fail to give any indication of how instructors should implement video games nor if those implementation methods will be successful with any degree of certainty. Yeah, I suppose I said that they offer methods, but not in a manner that an instructor can pull directly to a lesson plan. They talk about using video games in a way that seems like substitution for other forms of media, and I suppose that's a much better way than what I've seen in which a math teacher hands over a lemonade stand and stands back hoping for student understanding and subject area gains. That method is pretty much debunked, and this shows some promise for successful integration using video games as a medium or a tool. In short, then, teachers need to recognize video games are dependent on them to be effectively integrated. They are not teachers, they are tools, a medium only. Handing a student a book and saying, go to town, is likely to get the teacher fired, and likewise handing over a game and saying, this is meant to teach you, will likely do the same. And teachers need to be comfortable with what they're teaching it wouldn't be wise to pass out Shakespeare having never read him before. It almost sounds like common sense, but teachers can't just choose a game, throw it out for the class to study, and expect good instruction. Which reminds me, I think it was Schultz, Colby, and Colby that said video games will make uh, extra effort for implementation, but for them it was worth the effort. And I hold that good pedagogy is good pedagogy, no matter the tool or medium or teacher. Anyway, if a teacher is going to use video games, they need to make considerations for female students in that they will struggle with self-efficacy a bit more and they'll be motivated differently toward playing than males. Also, instructors should be painfully aware of the costs. Gaming isn't exactly the cheapest hobby. Some research that would really help in this study would be having more pre- and post-test studies done on the effects of gaming in the classroom. These should define and include methodology write-ups for the instructors to be able to implement later. There should really be some studies into gender differentiation. I'm lost as to how to differentiate a game that doesn't do so itself in some way. MMOs have a lot of ways to play, but FPSs are going to be a struggle. There was also little or no mention of socioeconomic status in the survey results. 
You said that motivation didn't change across the various strata, but I wonder how it could be afforded and thus comfortable for users at the lower end, and how that might affect teaching. Also, none of these studies seem to mention the effects on creativity or critical reasoning. I know videos have studies showing decreased creativity, and so I wonder how that works in games. And if games do present challenges and students overcome, doesn't that show critical reasoning, if not subject area increases? So wouldn't that be a good thing? Like I said, there needs to be more studies. And so in conclusion, we find a lot of mixed results for using video games in the classroom. There are some positive things going on, uh, like proven use of general intelligence, but there are a lot of uncertainties, such as whether subject matter gains are present. While used as a medium, this isn't exactly required, as it does fail to meet the standard of, say, books, where students gain reading practice while gaining medium knowledge for later reporting. So only teachers that really want to be doing this, that are willing to take on the extra burden and pre be prepared to try new things, should be implementing video games in their classrooms for now. But if research can one day demonstrate how to make video games into successful learning devices, video games could be the educational Konami code. The Konami code is an allusion to a way to cheat in video games to become very powerful. References